Hello, and welcome to the Open Systems Media webcast titled Architect with Care, an efficient success route to CAST 32A compliant multi-core certification. My name is John McHale, Group Editorial Director with Military Embedded Systems and moderator for today's event. Our speakers today are Van Silderman, CTO with AFusion, and Mark Brown, Systems Architect with Link Software Technologies. Van Silderman is a 30-year aviation safety, security, safety critical engineering expert. He holds a BSEE and MBA from Gonzaga and a Master's in Computer Engineering from USC, where he was a Hughes Fellow. He is focused on safety critical aviation, avionic software systems, hardware development, and related technical certification solutions for his entire career. In 1990, he founded TechSci and was then was president and CTO of his company for 14 years. Vance developed the world's first DO-178, DO-200, and DO-254 training. Vance was also the principal founder of HireLi Incorporated, an aviation software system certification company which was acquired by Otago Artisan back in 2011. He invented and developed the first certification gap analysis for DO-178, DO-200, ARP-4754A, and DO-254. Vance is also the principal author of many technical white papers and, and a book on avionics development certification that was published by Avionics Communications entitled Avionics Certification, a Complete Guide to DO-178B and DO-254. All royalties to the book are donated to the Boy Scouts of America, where Mr. Hilderman and two of his sons are Eagle Scouts. Our second speaker, Mark Brown. In his position as uh, links as a system architect, Mark focuses on safety critical safety critical and security certifications. His activities include analysis of publications by safety certification regimes, including ARP 4754, DO-178, EN5-012X, ISO 26262, IEC 61508, and selected supporting documents. He performs requirements engineering for Link Secure, including semi-formal analysis of its types and terms and validation analyses for its implementation of specific semiconductor chips. In this role, he also evaluates tools that support formal methods for requirements, implementation, and verification activities within the software development lifecycle. Mark has extensive experience with the development and maintenance of critical systems and with developing and maintaining assurance for these systems for use in high threat environments. He has conducted vulnerability analyses and risk assessments for military systems, banks, and crypto systems, including hardware-based side channel analysis and Shannon-based covert channel analysis. And now, we have some, our sponsors for today's event are AFusion and Link Software Technologies. Now for some housekeeping announcements. This and all Open Systems Media webcasts are copyrighted and may not be recorded or used in any way without the express written consent of Open Systems Media. This webcast will consume about 40 to 45 minutes, leaving the remaining time for the question and answer session. Now I'd like to point out some important buttons on your screen. First, please take note of the Enlarge Slides button. By clicking on this button, you'll be able to view the slides in full screen mode. You can use the Download Slide button to make these, the slides larger and see them as a PDF. The second important button is the Forward to a Friend button, which enables you to email a friend to register for the event. The last button I'd like you to look at on your console window allows you to enter questions in real time. We'll do our best to address these questions during the closing Q&A session. If you have a question intended for a specific speaker, please note so at the beginning of your question. Otherwise, I'll hand out the questions equally to all our speakers. If you have a question pertaining to the webcast operation itself, one of our technicians will respond back to you during the webcast. Please note that as much as we'd like to, we may not get to all of your questions today. In that case, someone may get back to you after the webcast with more information. This webcast will be archived online and be available for one year. It will also be an MP3 version of the event available. And now I'll turn it over to Van Silderman to start the presentation. Van, take it away. Fantastic. John, thank you very much for that nice, kind introduction. And it's truly a pleasure to be here with Mark as well. Well, folks, this is multi-core processing and certification strategies. It's a complex topic, but it really can be taught in 45 minutes at an overview level. It's a fascinating topic, so let's just dive right in, okay? As Mr. McHale said about us, Fusion is a large safety critical consulting company. I think we've worked on most aircraft in the last 20 years over 250 projects, 30 countries. We do a lot of training, mentoring, certification, gap analysis. We sell our processes checklist. And we have engineers working in oh, seven countries right now, several different offices. Mark, you want to give a quick overview of Lynx as well? Sure. Uh, Lynx Software Technologies is a products company, and we have two primary products, the Lynx OS 178, which is a uh, hard real-time operating system, and the Link Secure, which is the newer of the two. 
both of these products provide partitioning and integration solutions for modular and open systems architecture. Fantastic. Thanks, Mark. So, folks, let's dive right in. Quick agenda. We're going to do 20 years in one minute, very quick. Briefly describe what is multi-core and why. And then what's needed for safety critical multi-core from a hardware? What are the challenges software? CAS32, Certification Authority Software Team. What is that all about? And then what about certifying under CAS32A? We'll talk about some differences between the old CAS32 and the new CAS32A. And then we'll wrap up, and we should have 10 or 15 minutes for your questions. So when you have questions, start thinking of those. You can submit them now, and those will be moderated by Mr. Michaela at the end. Okay? So you know how our little webinars work here. We want to keep you engaged. We have a quiz for you. Let's see how you do on this quiz. We'll answer these in 40 minutes. First, what do we think? Clear requirements are a must for certifying safety critical software. Thorough testing, number two, can ensure multi-core processing determinism. Number three, MCP certifiable supervisor software is required or optional for airborne. The question says optional. Now, MCP chip performance testing could be completed early to support DO-178C efforts. Number five, our MCP can be readily certified to MCP selection if minor concerns. And number six, safety critical requirements are too stringent for MPCs to be visible near term. What do you think? Ponder those questions as we dive in, okay? Now, let's have Mark give us a quick 20 years in one minute. <laughs> Thanks, Vance. Well, so it's hard to boil this all down, but perhaps the most interesting angle on the past 20 years as it relates to CAS32A is the story of why opening a path up to MCP certification took so long. So looking at the dates, 1998 is sort of the status quo or the historical, where Federated Avionics single-core processors, RTOS optional, was sort of the ruling norm. And then in 1999, we got a result from a scientist by the name of John Rushby. This, uh, this report was commissioned by both FAA and NASA, and in it, John Rushby links partitioning and your partitioning architecture to modularity. In his own words, he says, the purpose of this report is to identify the requirements for partitioning in integrated modular avionics, IMA, and achieve those requirements with very high assurance. So in his report, he produces uh, the gold standard with uh, some collaboration from friends at Honeywell, uh, friends at Rockwell Collins, and friends at NASA. The gold standard is that the software partitions have to remain as isolated as if they were running on separated hardware. Well, 2001, we saw a commercial multi-core chip. 2004, the FAA uh, said that the reusable software components are now acceptable. And in 2005, with John Rushby on the committee, the RTCA released DO297, the Integrated Modular Avionics IMA standard. Well, some time went by. And in 2010, the FAA said that they now had an acceptable means to apply the IMA standard. But still, no multi-core. In 2014, the CAS32 paper, predecessor to 32A, was released. But plus or minus a month from its release, the FAA's John Strasburger gave this status report at a conference. We're not ready yet for MCPs. So that went away. It wasn't until 2016 that we really had the first feasible path to MCP certification. In it, CAS32A, we're given these a list of topics that we need to address because that could impact the safety, performance, and integrity of a software airborne system executing on multi-core processors. What was interesting to note was that the difference between 32 and CAS32A 
was the reorganization around terms and concepts from the DO-297 IMA. And hopefully that explains why I included some of those prior bullets on this 20-year summary. Well, I'll stop there and just note that in 2018, ESA put a wrinkle into everything and reached all the way back to 2005 and edited the uh, the very center of what what Table 4 in DO-297 says is the best path to certification. So our minute is up, and we can proceed along the same lines of thought that the Certification Authority software team, CAST, proceeded on. To sum up the accomplishments of CAST 32A in one sentence, let's say that CAST 32A looked at the MCP hardware through the lens of an IMA system framework to provide assurance that modular software can meet safety deadlines. Following the agreement found in both ESA's AMC 2170 and the FAA CAS Teams 32A, we'll consider hardware next. So why do we have multi-core processors anyway? Well, I think the best answer comes in this slide, uh, which represents the economic realities of Moore's Law. The first thing I want to emphasize is that Moore's Law is the top line here. It's the straight up in an exponential curve uh, of the transistors that are increasing over time. But the problem that all the processor engineers have had to face over the years is seen better in the green and the red curves. The green curve, which is frequency, caps out, flattens out about 10 years ago. And the same is true for the watts. So what happens is, is that Moore's Law around 10 years ago, or right after 2000, hits almost a dead end. The reason I bring this up is because of what I want to call the MCP corollary. The way that we were able, well, the way that hardware engineers were able to continue reaching the economic you know, demands of Moore's Law was to increase the number of logical cores. And that is why we should anticipate MCP certifications in the future. It's just not reasonable to imagine that some hardware engineer will go to his manager right now in 2018 and propose that next year, let's build a single core. So let's zoom in on exactly what could be the problem here. I mean, what's the big deal? Right, so this slide illustrates the comparison between a single core processor on the left and a multi core processor on the right. The single core processor, you'll note, uh, is a box around the register file and the arithmetic logic unit, which is a collection of functions, right? And then it has its interface to the bus. Now, this is a very important interface and has become increasingly important as Moore's Law has progressed because the access times to go all the way out to memory have become increasingly slow compared to the frequency, the clock speed of the single core. Well, the problem when we go to multi-core is just that. I've highlighted the arrows here, but core one and core two, three, four, and all the other cores that you might put on an MCP are now beginning to contend for the same scarce resource. The bus interface is just the front door, but what goes on the back end is all of the memory and all of the I.O. devices, and these things increasingly are competing with each other in less and less professional ways, shall we say. Well, hardware complexity is not the only problem we face. It's not the only impetus, impetus that is pushing us towards MCP. The second reason is from software. And I'm showing here the complexity uh, of a 2007 Airbus IMA system as presented by uh, H. Butts in his paper. So while on the one hand this is nicely symmetrical and neatly organized and represents probably a great step forward in simplification and organization of an airborne system, I think it should be apparent to anyone who looks at this picture that there's quite a lot of software complexity covered in this diagram. So just to explain it to you briefly, each of the white rectangles represents 
uh, a software and hardware module which is computing a different function in the system. So we ask again, is software complexity really a problem? Why should we worry about this? To illustrate this, I'd like to uh, uh, bring up an example from a fellow by the name of Kevin Driscoll. First, I'd like to retell a story uh, told by Kevin Driscoll in his keynote address at the 2016 NASA Formal Methods Conference held in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Murphy was an optimist, he says, and Driscoll was known since he's a Honeywell Engineer Fellow with, only, with over 45 years of experience, a pioneer of the concept and terminology for time and space partitioning, and one of those acknowledged in John Rushby's 1999 NASA FAA technical report that I cited earlier. So let me tell you the story of two perfect routines named A and C. These two perfect routines were exhaustively tested using uh, a measure that is well beyond DAL-A's MCDC testing requirements. It, these routines were tested using every possible combination of internal state and input. Routine B, on the other hand, was not completely tested. And if you look at the diagram in the upper right, you'll see why his color code is different from A and C. He wasn't completely tested. Now, we know that the system had no timing problems, and then routine B started misbehaving. What was interesting about this case is that routine B started misbehaving after a trivial change to A and only A. So, after some difficulty in finding out the real problem, Driscoll was called in, and the question was, was B the culprit? It turned out to be C. And this was very puzzling to the engineering teams that were involved in this. Now, it can't happen. It was exhaustively tested. It hadn't even been changed. If you remember, only routine A had been changed in this story. So it was Driscoll's job to come in and sort out the answer. I really don't have time to go into all the details, but let me give you my brief summary. How could this really happen? Well, Fortran arrays start at 1, but the, compiler, the Fortran compiler did not include a check for illegal access at array index 0. It just subtracted 1 and accessed the array memory. On this particular 16-bit processor, it was none of the software routines, but rather the microcode that fatefully subtracted 1 from 0 to obtain the putative bit offset of 65,535, which translates to a memory access of 4,095 words beyond the start of the Fortran array being accessed in the location cited as data. This is shown in Driscoll's diagram in the upper right. Look for the red arrow in the plus 4095 words. In hindsight, it seems that this error was self-inflicted since these routines were first integrated. It's just that the damage done to routine B happened to be inconsequential. The latent error, which had never caused a problem in B before, activated as a fault simply because the size of routine A had changed. That is, when the size of routine A changed, the usual damage done to routine B now became a problem manifested as a fault in the language of DO178. To fix the error, software in routine C was improved to check for illegal array access at index 0. And so ends the story of two perfect routines. But the moral of the story may be stated quite differently than Driscoll did when we consider the red arrow of plus 4095 words. The assumption that is illustrated in Driscoll's diagram includes separation, such that neither A, C, nor the integrated data should be able to reach out and damage routine B. But this assumption failed. And while a bug fix may have been applied to routine C, the primary reason this problem was so difficult to find by the engineer teams that worked on it was that the assumption itself was invisible, but still operative. Point being, rather than test Murphy's law by our assumptions about separation and modularity, we should choose a fail-safe. So I want to summarize right now and 
try to answer the question, why did IMA and MCP path to these certifications take so long? That concludes our 20-year story, right? But some notable airframe developers have already embraced IMA, and we can expect them to proceed towards MCP as CAS32A does. However, in a safety-critical context, there may be good reasons to proceed cautiously. We consider that perspective here as the conservative technology management hypothesis. Haven't we seen some uncertainty in the past 20 years about both IMA and MCP? For example, are these certification approaches optional? Then why should we take them? Are these certification paths still viable, or are they subject to dispute? And the third point is illustrated, I think, best by the diagram on the right. While on the one hand, some technology changes exponentially, for example, Moore's Law, on the other hand, organizations change logarithmically, glacially. And so as a good technology manager, you don't want to blow with every wind that flows by, right? You don't want to be completely changing your mind and asking to reverse course at every last minute. Another factor that makes it difficult to adopt IMA and MCP might be uh, the process of bottom-up feedback and perhaps you have a top-down organization. For example, the hardware team may note Moore's MCP corollary, but that is a bottom-up feedback. And the software team may note increasing complexity because of all the features that have been accepted and accumulated over the years. But that, again, is bottom-up feedback. And it may be difficult for a top-down organization to find good ways to process and accept that. Finally, the conservative technology manager may know this truth, better the devil you know than the devil you don't. And certainly as we consider MCP, the harbor interference is a devil you don't know. Regarding IMA, you may not know about how you're going to get to Arink 600 plugs and, uh, and uh, time division Ethernet uh, network. In both cases, you may have proven legacy hardware you may be concerned about the decreased feature size in these new processors, and you may just be not quite ready for the change. So now we conclude our 20-year story. And at this time, I'd like to turn it back to Vance to explain a little bit more about what remains the same given a new MCP and IMA certification context. Thank you, Mark. That was terrific background. Folks, we're going to dive into the details right now, including CAS 32A, but first a real quick two slides of background. Remember, with 178C and now, of course, CAS 32A MCP, we have to ask ourselves, what is necessary? Three key elements. First, that planning process. The same five plans, three standards. Those need to consider MCP and CAS 32A, especially the issues that we'll describe in just a couple of minutes. And we'll also talk about the common mistakes and best practices. Then there's the MCP development process. That's not just the coding implementation. It's, remember, the ecosystem development. It's the planning, including safety. Is your MCP safety? Is it safe? Then it's the requirements, high level, then low level, then the design, then the code. But look at that big box, the green one, the correctness process. Why is it green? Ask yourself why it's green. We made it that way for a reason. Well, the correctness process is continuous throughout that project. It has to show and prove, remember, guilty until proven innocent in this world. It's the opposite. We have to prove that we followed CAS 32A plus DO178C. So it's the verification which is reviews, tests, analysis, quality assurance, configuration management. And if you guessed the reason for the green being the color of American money, you are right. It's green because it's very, very expensive unless we do things right. Well, let's take a look and see what does doing things right entail. Well, here's the top eight right here. First is those detailed plans. As we mentioned, five plans, three standards and proving compliance to CAS 32A. 
then multiple criticality assurance levels. We've got consistency, of course, but the key challenge with multi-core processing is determinism. As Mark described briefly, and we're going to talk technically now, it's the potential resource contention, interference channels, we call them, shared memory, cache, communications. We have to prove that we're deterministic in all possible runtime instances. So start thinking about dynamics there. Then traceability, top to bottom, have we proven we've covered all the requirements, including MCP, and then back for DAL A, B, and C, which is most of your applications using MCP, you have to show that every line of code is there for a reason. Independent verification and MCP robustness. Now, DO-178C always required robustness testing. Remember robustness, rainy day, boundary values, error values, illegal values, state transitions, but MCP adds many more. We have to think of WESET, worst case execution time, and our architecture. So we need to know the architecture of our software, what could run in parallel, what are the communication channels, how is the cache, and that communication perform. Then, of course, the coding rules and assessments. And finally, remember, guilty until proven innocent. Show our receipts. Show that we had plans and standards for MCP compliance and that we reviewed against that. Okay? So Mark's going to dive into the details right now. Mark? Thanks, Vance. Thanks for helping us see what's remained the same about the software process. I'd like to travel even further toward the unmoving center of our jobs, if possible, if that's possible, and talk about what actually makes safety-critical software safe. To do so, I've borrowed this picture from Nancy Levison, a professor of aeronautics and astronautics at MIT. In her book, Engineering a Safe Safer World, she presents this picture as is a non-controversial summary of the heart of nearly all safety systems, whether medical, nuclear, or avionics. So Levison here shows the common two loops, the merger of two loops that form a safety system. First, on the right, the classical control loop uh, shows computer, sensors, actuators, and process. Second, on the left, the operator-assisted and monitored human interface. In avionics, the process that, you know, she's generalized here, that rectangle means the airframe. So we can imagine it in flight, in takeoff, and during landing, etc. What is shown is a safety level view. At the highest, or safety level, one takes into account not only the software and the hardware, but also the communication, the arrows shown. Once communication between the boxes is in view in the frame, then we can begin to emphasize and really see the meaning of the safety critical concerns for deadlines. Both avionics software developers and the system integrators need to give their undistracted attention to the real-time deadlines, and these deadlines need to be supported by deterministic end-to-end -end software completion times. Where are the deadlines? So the first deadline I've drawn, and this could be debated, uh, shows the computer computing a control law based on the inputs from the sensors and then delivering its outputs to actuators that actually fly the plane. In the second set of deadlines, which I've shown in a little bit different color here, we reconnect the pilot to his plane so he can complete the human interactions needed for this flight. In both cases, what we're talking about here and what remains essential is that you must never miss a deadline. To apply this, I just wanted to show uh, in the upper right uh, a set of avionics software that does need to meet critical real-time deadlines. Uh, this is borrowed from the FAA's TC-1651. And it shows the criticality from high to low and also the number of milliseconds uh, for each of their deadlines. So how does this safety principle relate to CAS 32A? This is where we get to the truly challenging parts of CAS 32A. So I wanted to start by giving an overview picture of one of the primary concerns. That is memory non-determinism. 
in the top diagram of this pair, we're showing measurements taken from a single core processor. Here we have a tightly bunched histogram of memory accesses that are all hovering at just less than five microseconds or 5,000 nanoseconds. At the bottom, we see the problem illustrated. Not only does the main, the, the tallest vertical bar, bar shift to the right of 5,000 nanoseconds and start to approach 7,000 nanoseconds, so it's definitely delayed, right? You're not gonna get it any faster. But the bad thing about this is the histogram shows a wide array of non-deterministic responses that spread out all the way up to about 15,000 nanoseconds. So if you used to be at 5,000, you now could see responses up to 15,000. Now, let's take in mind that this is a microscopic view of the hardware. What we're seeing here is a single memory page access which is the finest granularity that you can really measure on a modern computer, a four kilobyte block. And the cache is gonna take that block and do what it will with it. But this is exactly the thing that causes, you know, deadlines to be missed because how many uh, memory accesses are going to be needed within your 50 millisecond period or your 10 millisecond period? There could be a terrific number of memory accesses and each one of these takes this single view of the problem, this one instance view, and multiplies it by 100, 1,000, or much more. So in this second slide, I'm trying to unpack a little bit as to why that really happens. Why does the multi-core experience so much non-determinism in the memory access? In the upper right, I've shown sort of the round table view of how all these bus masters are competing with each other to try to go through the interconnect and then I guess not shown way off to the right would be the memory. It's kind of off chip, right? Um, at the center of the diagram, I've kind of zoomed in on a single cores view of the world. So uh, sort of not taking into account the other cores, the other bus masters, and just reading this from left to right you can see that the core, the CPU, is going to be issuing data requests and instruction requests against memory. And these are going to be going through several layers of private cache. And then there's going to be this backside cache. And then, you know, not shown is, you know, interconnect, which can be an additional place for competition until you finally uh, hit the main memory and get to do your round trip. So the memory access shown here depends on topology, on cache's location within the topology, and also on interconnect protocols and uh, cache coherence protocols. So that's the gist of the MCP hardware challenges to real-time deadlines. Let me turn it back over to Vance for a reminder of the certification process and life cycle at the system level. Thanks so much, Mark. So folks, Let's dive into robustness. Now, with 178C, we've always had that robustness, that deterministic requirement. But with MCP, let's take a step back and remember, we've got the safety assessment process. We have to show and include the safety analysis inclusive of MCP. So we use 4761 in the upper left for that. And the new version A that's going to be required for everybody, including military, next year. That gives us the architecture, the criticality level, or the development assurance level, the DAO as we call it. Then we determine the system requirement process. That's 4754A. Then the software and hardware, 170C and 254. But let's not forget that we've got that little, oh, that feedback process, okay? See those red arrows? Yeah, those just popped up. We have to prove under 178C and CAS 32A that we have continuously considered everything that I've just described. That's, again, safety, 4761, systems, 4754, software, 178, hardware, 254. We've done that continuously and proof throughout the system. The reason for that is we have to show that the increased robustness requirements, 
of CAS 32A are met. Remember, robustness, determinism. Let's take a look, and Mark will tell us about that robustness aspect as it fits into that ecosystem. Mark? Thanks, Vance. You know, um, just in the interest of time, I'm going to zip right through this, but, you know, one of the questions you may be asking is, do we even need to take the IMA systems view? Uh, and, you know, it's possible that you could skip it altogether. But the question, the question you should be asking about the IMA systems view versus the, the other systems view that we've already talked about with the ARP 4754 and the safety ARP 4761 is when is robust partitioning needed? As I mentioned in our history slide, which may seem like 20 years ago now, <laughs> the year 2018 was important to our story. ESA's AMC 2170 stated rather baldly that it was now breaking with FAA traditions about reusable software dating back to 2004 with respect to IMA certification. They said uh, the letter of acceptance concept is not feasible in the ESA context, and the RSC component is not feasible in the ESA context. You may be thinking, what? ESA can't rewrite the IMA standard now, 13 years later? Not after both FAA and ESA have blessed the standard and after several major airframes have completed IMA certifications and fly? There must be some misunderstanding. Well, yes. I think there may have been a misunderstanding. And so what I wanted to do was to go back even further than the 2005 IMA standard to John Rushby's 1999 technical report for NASA and FAA that stated the goal was how to get to IMA. And in it, he says, figure 2.1 here shows that there are different ways to look for modules. And just to illustrate the problem, um, look at this diagram with me with an open mind, a completely open mind, please. Without any context, one of us might try to argue that any of the boxes shown on either side of this diagram could be a module. Is hardware a module? Is an operating system a module or a kernel a module? Is the software in the partition the module? Even the components with in the partitions might be claimed to be a module, or ob object instances, if you're object-oriented, they too could be considered modules. And I would challenge you return, to return to the IMA standard of 2005 and see for yourself if these misunderstandings don't remain permissible within the language of that standard. So, different meanings for the same term module. Now ESA requires that we consider a module to be something like this. So John Rushby pointed out in option A that you could put a module on top of an operating system, likely a real-time operating system, likely a real-time operating system that did time and space partitioning like Kevin Driscoll pioneered and like John Rushby talked with Kevin Driscoll about as he wrote his paper. On the other hand, in option B, John Rushby suggests that it might be better to stick the operating service into the module and create a new thing called a separation kernel, or a kernel for short, that all it does is worry about the modularity. So now, in 2018, we pause to recognize this principle about modules your partitioning architecture defines them. So on the left, in option A, alternative A, the operating system with its hardware defines the module. On the right, the partitioning kernel with its hardware defines the module. And in both cases, as Isa points out just a month and a half ago, you depend on the hardware as well as upon the uh, core software or the kernel or operating system to define how the modules are going to work. I'd like to propose that if we as a community could simply clear away misunderstandings about which boxes in this diagram we really wanted to treat as modules, it would help us tremendously. Rushby wanted to, quote, identify the requirements for partitioning in IMA, 
because of this principle. Your partitioning architecture, whether it's an OS or a kernel, defines your modules. And just to apply my point, I'd invite you to consider which of the boxes in this same diagram correspond to uh, the 2007 Airbus approach to IMA that we saw earlier in this presentation. Did you circle all of alternative A? Everything in the left-hand side with the hardware operating system partition A and partition B all included in one module? If you did, that's correct. Each one of those corresponds to one of the white rectangles in Butts' 2007 Airbus approach to IMA. Let me do a quick test of your understanding of the right-hand side of this alternative, alternative B. If it's okay with you, I'd like to ask you to imagine what Rushby's alternative B might look like when deployed to a four-core MCP using CAST32A rules. Is this what you had in mind? My point is that as you move out from dual core into four core and higher MCPs, you begin to realize that the partitioning of software modules is only half the problem, the top half as shown. Not only must each software module be kept separate, but also all of the hardware resources should be partitioned as well. And I say the word partition in its strict, strict mathematical sense here, where an element in partition A cannot also exist in partition B. An OS, like an RTOS, tends to create a single monolith which supervises all of the hardware resources into a single point of locking, whereas a partitioning kernel tends to allow these parallelisms that you show here. And so, uh, you know, I should say right now, I work for Link Software Technologies, so the assumptions shown in this diagram came pretty readily to me. The bottom in the gray box I'm showing Link Secure implementing the kernel that Rushby talked about. And what it's doing is hardware resource management. In the upper left, there's two modules which are Lynx OS 178, and those are using the RSC component that FAA has already blessed many times, um, and that's shown for legacy compatibility with as an RTOS. In the upper center, there's a module which has no operating system, and in the upper right, just for the sake of making this example, this is a fictitious system, to make this example really challenging and sort of futuristic, I put an embedded Linux uh, just to see if you know, mixed criticality might work in this example. This is the sort of example that we at Link Software help existing customers work out in detail across the gamut of military, avionics, and other real-time embedded working sessions. We also work a number of examples in our training labs and demonstrations, so be sure to check out our, check out our booth at the next show. Well, now we've completed over half of our agenda. It's time to deliver on our promise to speak frankly about CAS 32A certification. My hope is that our use of IMA terms like robust partitioning and hardware resources as provided to modules from their perspective by their partitioning architecture, that platform, will all make sense as we dive into this rather dry certification guidance. Okay, in this slide, I present a capsule containing everything you would need to do to complete a CAS 32A MCP certification. In the table, the left-hand column quotes the CAS 32A identifier for each of its topics to address. In the right-hand column, I've proposed a summary of what you would owe to your certifier as document contents. So let me walk through this overview quickly. The first row, planning one, must document the MCP, the number of cores, the partitioning architecture, and list the hardware resources. The second row refines the sketch into a data file, which you could take to be in the form of a DO-178 PDIF Third, you propose an error detection and correction for that data, and then you prepare two lists. Next, in the middle, resource usage three, you owe to your certifier a list of interference channels, but this understates the problem. 
there's really no data sheet out there which is going to help you, uh, you know, just give you the answers for this task. You really need to start with your own analysis of the hardware topology that we discussed earlier and of your software allocations and hardware resource partitioning. So the answers to this might come, for example, in the form of the diagram that I showed two slides back. Now this is the part where compliance with CAS 32A starts to get very project specific. It also depends significantly on how you define a module. So this sort of work is very sensitive to what Rushby calls, quote, the requirements for partitioning in IMA. You know, summarizing all this on one page uh, helped me realize that I might want to put this into a project plan. So rather than finishing this slide off, let me jump to the next slide, which begins to suggest how I would interpret these as project phases. The first phase, the MCP planning phase, might be parallel or interleaved with your DO-178C software planning phase. And as I mentioned already, you're going to make your list, and then in resource usage three, this is where you do your preliminary analysis of where you expect to see hardware interference. I wanted to call this slide the development phase, but it surprised me. First note that only two of the CAS 32A topics landed in this phase. That is to say, while your DO-178C software team is working late nights, your CAS 32A team is taking it easy. And look at these topics. You probably already have some EDAC function built and laying around ripe for reuse. And usually the error handling problem, the second row, is something you've already scoped out when you selected your partitioning architecture. So this turns out to be more of a review from the perspective of multi-core processor. I'm not saying it won't be detailed, challenging analysis to accomplish, but on the other hand, handling errors should not come as a surprise to anyone working in a safety-critical domain. It's not till we get to this last phase, the verify phase, that things really become challenging for the MCP uh, certifying team. This is where you should expect a super performance test. The thing that's going to be challenging about this is that not only do you have to have your, you know, as the CAS 32A calls it, your intended final configuration done and baked, and your MCDC testing done, but you should expect that your DO-178C team has already gotten a little bit late as projects go with the difficulty of getting to MCDC coverage. So now that they're done and late, they hand you the baton, and you're going to have to start on some interesting and surprising performance testing. So uh, do expect that these system level tests anticipated in this phase will be slow to execute on hardware, they're going to follow their own evolutionary path, and they will require that you become a lot more intimate with your chip and chip vendor than you ever have before. While you're at it, don't forget that the mountains of evidentiary test results you generate here will need to be set into a pretty report for your software accomplishment summary once you're done. So you're better off to keep your records organized as you go. Well, I hope you found benefit in this briefing on CAS 32A and feel like you now have a firm grip on what the new guidance really means. Vance and I would like to leave you with a few takeaways and also give you the opportunity for Q&A. But before we do, let's pause to recap what a person might expect of any CAS 32 certification effort. You might expect that after software verification in your DO-178C, you need to start a whole new round of testing. You'll also notice that MCP latencies are worse than SCP, and that your interference affecting worst case execution time will be the challenge here. What will be hard? worst case execution time, and all the supporting analysis tasks. You're going to have to think of new measurements, and you're going to need to apply new controls over your hardware. All of this to risk, or at least to mitigate the risk of missed deadline for your deadline-sensitive, safety-critical software. So how could a partitioning architecture help? Well, that's going to define your modules, and that's going to group your resources. 
it's also going to lead to the potential you know, that you would be able to certify in the future under IMA rules and obtain incremental certification credit for your modules. Well, when Vance and I flipped the coin for who would go first, I, I managed to win. So let me uh, follow up all that information with a few higher level pieces of advice from Link Software. The three pieces are these. Solve at the har hardware software interface, not the software software interface. Engage in system level solution improvement and certify using IMA. Let me take the next three slides, three or four slides to uh, pursue this in a little more detail. First of all, I think this may be the most important diagram, so I reproduced it here. Here I'm showing the modules, the two different definitions of modules. And what I want to point out is that Whichever one you choose, you're going to get some additional side effects. First, if you take the option B on the right, using a tiny partitioning kernel instead of a large operating system to accomplish the crucial module forming partitioning, you're going to find that within the module, you'll have a better position from which to test and control hardware interference. That's because, and what I've shaded on the bottom here, is that whether it's an operating system plus hardware on the left or a kernel plus hardware on the right, this really becomes the interconnect through which you're going to be doing your end-to-end -end performance testing. So hey, Mark, we're going to have to wrap it up real quick here, buddy. We're going to have to wrap it up, okay? Okay. Well, let me actually zip over and... Uh, give you the floor. Okay, fantastic. No problem. Folks, well, Mark is incredibly competent with great information for us here. And so we're going to make these slides available to you. You can log back in, of course, and watch them through the Open Systems Media site. Now let's take a look at some recommendations from our side. First, we need to really simplify the architecture to minimize the potential MCP interference. We'll talk about that real briefly. But you need to adopt an MCP certifiable partitioning architecture, a platform, okay? And select a RTOS a kernel for portability. And remember, there's three key steps. Identify potential interference, analyze each of those, and then mitigate. So you want to do one and two to accomplish that. And then finally, number four, adopt MCP robustness verification. What would that look like real quick, okay? Now, let's take a look. First, that's recommendation number one. Great advantages for MCP, but you can consider asymmetric multiprocessing, permanently allocate each uh, process VM to a separate core, and consider that each core has its own RTOS. could be identical. And also, consider BMP, bound multiprocessing, where you bound it. You want to minimize the dynamics, okay? That's the real key, minimizing the dynamics. Next recommendation, just focus partitioning, okay? Shared resource usage is very complex. You have to consider that. So use one or both of Rushby's alternatives, as Mark described, to help you out with that and show how you do that within your plans, okay? Now, identify, analyze, mitigate. Identify those interference paths. Put them in your PSAC, actually. And then, within your development verification plan, show how you assess those and mitigate them, okay? Now, real quick, robustness. It's all about that robustness, proving it. You have to prove it. So what does that mean? Well, you have to consider what the worst case execution time is, how those interference channels could potentially interfere, and then prove that you have planned, verified, and actually done the proper validation work, including checklists, that you've identified all those shared resource and interference channels, including the time and space boundaries. The associated MCP settings are really important. Those are configurable, so you have to consider what are the actual attributes of configuration? Have you proven that you've verified them all? And then you have an application. That's why you're using MCP. How does the application use that? What does the architecture look like for AMP, SMP? And how is it bound or not bound? What could happen at runtime? How can we minimize the dynamics? 
and then verify that mitigation strategy. Okay? It's really crucial that you do that. Verify the mitigation strategies. Absolutely. Folks, we're wrapping it up. How do we do on that quiz? Clear requirements exist for certifying safety critical MCPs. No, they don't. Okay, take our advice here. Use those or call us if you need help. Number two, thorough testing can ensure MCP determinism. No, remember analysis. There's manual human analysis involved. Number three, an MCP certifiable RTOS is optional for certified MCP systems. Not really. Okay, you you won't be able to do it that way. Number four. MCP chip performance testing should be completed early to support 170C planning efforts. Ooh, cannot. You can prototype, but the final testing is done at the end. Then, any MCP can be readily certifiable, so MCP selection is of minor concern. Oh, goodness, no. Now, that comes first, okay? And finally, safety critical requirements are too stringent for it. MCPs to be viable near term? No, absolutely not. Using the techniques of CAS 32A and what we've demonstrated and shown you here, it's absolutely viable. Folks, you can truly do this, okay? Now, let's continue. Just to wrap up here, Fusion has a lot of solutions to help you out with training, gap analysis, checklists, templates. If you have additional questions, feel free to get back to us after this uh, webinar here, okay? And then if you have additional questions, here's our contact information. I'd like to turn it back over to John at this time. John, can you give us a conclusion and see if we have much time left? Thanks, Vance. That brings us right to our time limit for today. Unfortunately, the, we weren't out of time for a Q&A, but we have your questions, and the speakers will get back to you uh, with more information after the webcast. I'd like to thank Vance and Mark for speaking today, and AFusion and Link Software Technologies for sponsoring the event. Please remember that this and all Open Systems Media webcasts are copyrighted and may not be recorded or used in any way without the express written consent of Open Systems Media. This webcast will be, will be archived online today and be available for one year. There will also be an MP3 version of the event available. Thank you all for attending. I look forward to seeing you in future Open Systems Media webcasts. Goodbye. <laughs>